Look me in the eye right now and tell me that you are absolutely certain that your tires on your car are at the optimum pressure. If you can do that, might as well leave right now. There's nothing for you to see here, clearly. But if not, perhaps you'd best stick around because what I've got to say on this might just save your life. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that's up there now, dude. Running your tyres at the correct pressure is guaranteed to extend their life. And that's an 800 buck ish investment, maybe more for most people, plus... It makes a huge difference to your safety in any emergency out there on the road. And the only problem with this scenario is exactly what is the Goldilocks pressure for the tyres on your car. Let's find out. This video is sponsored by Olight, a great company with a great range of high quality flashlights. Olight is my go-to flashlight for everyday carry. Five year warranty, waterproof, drop tested, brilliant products, literally and metaphorically. There's a flash sale for Olight tonight from 8pm, that's up to 35% off selected models and 10% off outside the sale duration. My code and the link is in the description below, we'll have more on that in just a sec. So, on tyres, right, it's dead easy for mug punters out there on the road to presume that modern cars are pretty much maintenance free, like totally maintenance free. The only problem is... They're not, and this means that despite all of the advancements, you really should still check your tyre pressures and the vital fluids, which would be, at a minimum, the engine oil and radiator coolant level every week. Make it a ritual, okay? Like talking to friggin' Jesus or something. The bottom line here is that you can lose, say, half the air out of a modern radial tyre, and it's going to look superficially and feel completely normal for everyday driving. However, if you need to stop in an emergency or swerve, it's just not going to perform very well at all. Meaning the gap separating life and death in this situation gets compromised more than it already is and certainly more than it needs to be. And Inconveniently, there's no backspace button on any of this, as in so many other things in life. It just happens to you, and you do not get to go back and do things differently, like better. Air loss in tyres typically happens gradually, and you just don't feel it. It can be, I don't know, one PSI every week. And if your car has annual servicing intervals, as so many modern cars do, and you elect not to bother checking the air for yourself or you just don't know that you need to do that, after let's say about 16 weeks, you will have lost about half the air in that leaky tyre. And at that point, safety and durability are both seriously compromised, like ridiculously compromised. And there are so many cars driving around out there like that today, compromised in this way. And of course, this might happen only to one tyre, which further leads to instability in an emergency. Like, imagine swerving on four tyres and one of them's only got half as much air in it as it needs to keep up with the other three. What a pity if it happens to be the one at the front on the outside of the swerve. So, you really do have to take responsibility for this, in my view. In a car with a tyre pressure monitoring system, of course, this can be as simple as just flicking to that tyre pressure display on the menu system while you are stopped at the lights and just confirming that everything is okay. But in most cars, this is going to mean actually getting out in the driveway preemptively and measuring the tyre pressures cold before you drive off using your own tyre pressure gauge for consistency. If you want another reason to bother, and hey, let's face it, you really shouldn't need one because saving a life, potentially your own life, should really be sufficient. But here's that extra reason anyway, okay? If you are operating a tyre just a little bit low, only slightly, the wear rate skyrockets. So you'll be binning that 800 buck investment and going again well before otherwise you might have to. 
And this leads us to the key question, right? Which is, what is that correct tyre pressure for you? A seemingly simple question with, frankly, a not so simple answer. I look at it like this, okay? If you're just an average driver with no real enthusiasm for driving, just open the driver's door and find the tyre placard which is on a sticker inside the door frame and run with the manufacturer's recommended tyre pressures. And if you're a bit of a lead foot, you know, you can bump the pressure up by 10 to 20% quite safely. So if the manufacturer says 32 PSI all around, then 36 to 38 is going to be just fine for you. You will get better dynamic performance and about the same wear rate, but possibly a slightly less compliant ride quality, okay? It's a better balance for more assertive driving. For 90% of the people out there on the road today, this is going to be sufficient to maximise your safety and minimise your contribution to the profits of Pirelli, Continental, Michelin, Dunlop, Goodyear, Bridgestone, et al. Okay? And whatever you do when they wear out, do not buy cheap replacement tyres from virtually unknown brands. I am convinced off the back of a hell of a lot of track testing that they're just not as good, those cheapies, at saving your neck when the chips are down. Hashtag no backspace button. If you're a proper driving enthusiast, of course, you might want to approach this a little differently. The more complex tyre pressure answer for driving enthusiasts in just a sec. But right now, Olight is offering up to 35% off in a flash sale from 8pm tonight. Tonight being Monday the 22nd of March 2021. And that will happen until midnight tomorrow being the 23rd, obviously. There's a link in the description and you'll get 10% off at other times if you use my discount code, which is also below. This little baby here is the Baton 3. It's Olight's most popular torch and a pint-sized photon production powerhouse. Like, it's so tiny, you are never going to feel it at all down there. And it packs a punch, like 1,200 lumens, which is insanely bright for a device this small. That's in turbo mode. And then you get like 300 lumens, which is plenty bright enough for general purpose flashlight work. And this thing is so small that there's really no excuse for not having it with you at all times, like even in the shower, dude, because it's waterproof to two meters. And it comes with a neat carry case, which is also a 3500 milliamp hour battery bank designed to recharge the torch up to 3.7 times. So that's pretty versatile if you're going to be away from a power source for a few days and you need a dependable but diminutive light. And up the other end of the scale, of course, for this sale is this beast, the Marauder 2. Like, this thing is insane though. It's 14,000 lumens of floodlight from 12 radially mounted LEDs in the lens, okay? And then in the center there, where that black hole appears to be, there's a super bright 500 lumen LED in the center with a converging lens. And that's designed for throwing a narrow beam 800 meters down the track as a spotlight and it recharges by waterproof USB-C port in the back, and that is also dust protected thanks to a built-in iris. And if that's not enough, and it should be, but if it's not, it's also this thing, a 54 watt hour USB power bank. So if your phone goes down while you're out there on location, you just plug it into the torch and it's gonna recharge most electronic devices at a rate of up to 30 watts. So that's kind of practical when the chips are down out there. You just flick the switch on the top to go from flood to spot and you rotate the dial to adjust the brightness. And when you don't need extreme light output, there are seven different light modes. Like it'll run at 400 lumens for 22 hours. So super versatile for search and rescue, marine use, hunting, and breaking down somewhere on the road to Dingo Piss Creek. You can turn it down, of course, and use it like a normal flashlight around the campsite, and then it'll go to super bright in seconds for signalling and emergencies. Link in the description and discount code for both as well. Like, I converted to Olight a little over a year ago now, and today 
I carry one everywhere, every day, and I've never had one crap out on me when I needed it. So there's that. So here's the nerdier answer for driving enthusiasts, and it starts like this, right? There is no one-size-fits-all tyre pressure that's just right for your car or whatever, because there are so many variables, and they all relate to load, okay? And we could break that down into two camps, because there's dynamic load and static load, okay? So static load's the easiest one to consider. You know, if you've got a people mover and you're routinely carting around seven or eight people, then that's a fair bit of load. Or if you're a tradie and you've got a ute or a van that's like full of tools every day, then that's a fair bit of static load and you'll need to increase the pressure to compensate. And if you're a bit of a lead foot or an enthusiastic sort of sporty driver or you do track days or something of that nature, then the dynamic loads experienced by the tyre as a result of cornering this way and cornering that way and all of that kind of stuff and braking, of course, that's going to impose a great deal more load than if you're just, you know, driving Miss Daisy every day. So the Goldilocks pressure is dependent on the loads that you impose. And the differential diagnosis for that is tyre wear, like is the wear even or uneven? Now this tyre you're looking at now, and I apologise, a bit blurry down here, but hey, optics. This is a high performance tyre, it's a Pirelli P0, which is one of the world's most sort of acknowledged best high performance tyres. If memory serves, it's a 235-35R19, so it's got nearly no sidewall and a whole lot of grip, and it's an asymmetric tread pattern. You can see over here it's got these big fat blocks on the outside designed to do the cornering, and it's got these circumferential grooves here that are designed to deliver uh, high speed stability, and it's got these smaller blocks with more sort of side tread patterns in them just here, which are designed to eject water when it rains, okay? So that's just the way asymmetric tyres roll. And what I'd suggest is that if you're an enthusiastic driver in a vehicle that wears tyres like this, then whatever the placard says, do plus 20%, okay? So if it says 32, go for about 38, you know? 36 to 38 would be absolutely fine as a starting point. And then what you've got to do is look at how the wear is manifesting itself across the tread face. Now, you can do that using your strange mental powers, like just by looking at it, or you could go old school and use something like this, like an old vernier caliper or something, which has a depth probe on it, and you could actually physically measure the distance down to the bottom of the valley of the tread face in each case, and you could keep little records, and you could do it at a variety of points around the tread face, and make sure you don't measure on top of one of these uh, tread wear indicators here, because you'll get like a false reading if you do that. If the wear is more or less even, like you're losing a millimetre here and a millimetre here and a millimetre here over whatever time duration, then you've got the pressure pretty much Goldilocks for your tyre, okay? And obviously, you take your car to the track and do a track day or something, you're going to pump up the pressure for that because that's all about high speed stability and, you know, additional resistance in the tr in the sidewalls to prevent this part of the tyre on the outside edge in particular from just rolling over and having the sidewalls actually touch the track because they're not particularly good at gripping the road and they're not that durable, okay? So you'd want to do that. And then if you do your tread wear measurement over time and you notice that you're getting more wear in these grooves in the centre here relative to the edges, then the pressure's too high, dude, and you'll need to just back it off a couple and see if you get a better result after that in terms of evenness of wear across the entire tread face. And of course, if the wear is more excessive on the edges, and you might want to measure, you know, the initial depth of the tread just here on the outside edge and just here on the outside edge as well when you get the tyres and see how that's going as part of your measurement regime because if you're wearing more here and not very much here, that's a typical sign of underinflation, which is very common with tyres when people don't check the pressure. They lose uh, air over time and you get more wear on the edges than in the centre. And if that's happening to you, then it's time to pump up a little bit, you know. That's pretty simple and anyone can do it. There's a couple of caveats on this and aren't there always when you drill down into the complexity of this kind of thing. 
And one of those would be that in right-hand drive markets like ours, okay, the front left-hand tyre, which would be the passenger side tyre, is going to wear out quicker because the left-hand turn radius at intersections, and this is typical of cars that get used in the city and do a lot of intersection driving, the left-hand radius is tighter than the right-hand turn radius, okay? So you've got to turn the left-hand tyre harder and it's going to scrub more as a result of that and therefore it's going to wear more on this edge because that's just how the wear plays out. If you're in most of the rest of the world, including America, then that's going to happen on the front right-hand tyre because everything's just mirror reversed for left-hand drive. And this is one reason why it's a great idea to do tyre rotation. And if you're going to do tyre rotation, all I would do is get the back tyres and put them on the front and then uh, 5,000 k's later get the front tyres and put them on the back, right? And just swap them front to rear and that way you don't have to worry about them rotating in the other direction and things of that nature, okay? It'll also even up this outside edge wear a little bit between the front and rear left hand and front and rear right hand tyres. And it's particularly relevant for front drive cars, this whole wear at the front on the outside edge thing, because those tyres are steering as well as driving, okay? So they're doing a big job, whereas the tyres down the back are really just along for the ride, unless you drive super aggressively. And in that case, you know, particularly if you've got an all-wheel drive car, it's really a good idea to try and even up the wear as much as you can. And obviously at replacement time with all-wheel drive cars, plenty of manufacturers say that uh, you need to replace all four at once. And that's why you need to sort of even up the wear to get the most bang for your buck out of those tyres. Otherwise, you'll have one that's cactus right? And the other three are still okay and you'll have to bin all four, which is A, a waste of resources and B, it hits you in the hip pocket. So the long answer to this question is that the correct pressure for you depends on you and your vehicle and how hard you load it and how hard you drive it. And the only way to tell if you've got it right is by measurement and long-term sort of observation. And the other thing I'd point out is I wouldn't be too worried about going above the placard pressure because manufacturers often set the placard pressure predicated on ride comfort as well as handling, okay? And if you want handling, then obviously you'll be pumping the tyres up a little bit harder. Comfort and uh, conformity of the ride is going to take a hit, but dynamic performance will improve. And you could say to yourself, I don't really care about dynamic performance. I'd suggest that you really do. If a kid steps out in front of you or a truck breaches a stop sign obligation and you're right there and, you know, you're about to be coincident in space time with either of those things, dude, you really do care about dynamic performance. So there's that. So I'd suggest that this thing is a lot more complex than people give it credit for, but if you are pumping the tyres up and you're worried that the placard says 32 and you're all the way up to 38, then I'd suggest read the sidewall fine print because down there, it's literally down there on this one and I just read it. This Pirelli P0 says maximum inflation pressure 50 psi. So if you're running 32, 36, 38, 42, 44, whatever it is, then you're still well under the tyre manufacturer's maximum. And that means the tyre is operating safely. And really what you're doing is just tweaking the balance between dynamic performance and ride and wear rate. And you really do want to get all of those things right because saving your life is kind of important. And even if that never happens, and look, if you're a diligent driver, you can usually avoid all of those situations without having to emergency brake or swerve, but it's nice to be able to do that in a worst case scenario, right? But it's certainly going to save you money if you get this right. And it's also a good idea to take some interest in normal operation for your car, because if you notice a heap of wear on this edge or, or this edge, it might have nothing to do with the pressures and might have everything to do with driving over over a pothole that you've forgotten about like 200 k's ago or something and it's knocked the wheel alignment out and that's causing the tyre to scrub sort of profoundly as you're just driving down the road and this is obviously another way that tyre life is severely compromised so if you take a little bit of interest in what's going on across the tread face of your tyre it could save your life and it's certainly going to save you money. 